What did Moses command you? Moses permitted a man to write a bill of divorce. Jesus responds to the Pharisee's question with this other question. Well, what did Moses command you? And they respond by changing what he said, just a little bit. They don't say, Moses commanded us. They say, Moses permitted us. Because Jesus is trying to get them to say what the law is. So that when he talks to them the rest of the time, he's using their words to them. He's using their own arguments. Moses permitted us. When they say that, they are in, implicitly acknowledging that that wasn't always the case, that divorce wasn't always possible, and that it's not a decree of God. It comes from Moses. And why does it come from Moses? Because of the hardness of their hearts. And Jesus reminds them, all right then, what's the real case? What God has joined together, let no man separate. A man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. A valid marriage is insoluble, cannot be broken, cannot be taken away by man, can only, only ends at death. And this is a hard teaching, especially for the heart of heart or those who have been wounded by the heart of heart. <clears throat> and in some sense, all of us, each one of us, are one of the heart of heart. We all have hard hearts. God is constantly trying to bring us closer to himself to make us saints, and we're always pushing back. Why? Because of our own little or big hardnesses of heart. And in this sense, I'm going to define hardness of heart as stubborn attachment to the status quo. That is either the status quo of ourselves or of the environment. And this gets manifested by saying things like, well, I am who I am. I mean, that's who I am. Or I like things just the way they are. Why do they have to change? And the reason why we say these things when people challenge us, when God challenges us, when he wants to convert us, when he wants us to give up things, when he wants us to change, is because we're comfortable with their familiarity. We know what we're like in our fallenness and in our weakness. I know what makes me comfortable today. I, know, I don't really want to change. Even if it's hard, even if it's difficult, it's familiar. And maybe I don't want to get rid of it. Pharaoh in Egypt, right? When the, Mo when the Israelites are getting ready to be freed and Moses come before him, and it says he hardened his heart or God hardened his heart by withdrawing grace. That's because Pharaoh is comfortable having slaves. They make life comfortable. And it's a familiar thing. Without the slaves, which they'd had for 400 years, without the Israelites there, the Egyptians would have to go back to doing all the work for themselves. And that's pretty uncomfortable and unfamiliar. For myself, let's say, something that would be familiar and comfortable would be taking this gospel and preaching the same homily that I've heard hundreds of times in my life, probably. Just talking about divorce and adultery. Or I could just talk about our culture hates marriage, encourages divorce, encourages cohabitation and other mortal sins of that nature, encourages people to remarry after divorce and divorce again and remarry and divorce again and remarry, doesn't build up families, and even talk about the fact that there are bishops in Germany encouraging giving communion to those in the state of mortal sin who have divorced and remarried. I could talk about that. I could spend 45 minutes giving you statistics and stories about why all of that's evil, about how we have to fight against the culture and just be like, that's why we have to be counter-cultural. We have to be faithful. But that sort of homily, I've heard it so many times, I'm bored by it. And if I tried to preach a boring homily that I was bored by, you all would fall asleep because I'd be falling asleep while preaching. But that's comfortable. That's the status quo. That's what I'm familiar with. So let's shake it. Let's talk about something a little different. A gospel that talks about divorce, let's talk about what leads to that. Let's talk about the hardness of heart. Because there are many reasons why marriages fail, right? And we all know we've seen this in friends and family and maybe experienced it in our own lives. But all of those reasons, or most of those reasons, can usually be brought down, condensed to 
hardness of heart, a desire not to change, not to convert, to stay with who I am and not, I don't want to become someone different or I don't want to shake up the environment around me. It's comfortable even just because sometimes it's familiar. Sometimes there are people who won't even get out of bad situations just because that's what they always grew up with. That's what they've lived with their whole life. And the unfamiliar scares them even more than the bad situation that they're in. But we want to get out of it. Because our Lord says, why did Moses permit the bill of divorce? Because of the hardness of your hearts. Because without grace, without the sacraments, without the life of Christ living within them, without God, it's impossible to live married life fully and well and beautifully. So when the, when the apostles ask in another gospel, when they ask Jesus about this, and Jesus says, that's the way it is, divorce leads to adultery, the apostles go, well, it's better not to get married then. And Jesus responds with, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. With the help of divine grace, it is possible to live a faithful marriage, but it requires this continual conversion of heart. So for a valid and sacramental marriage to be this beautiful and everlasting, this beautiful living covenant, a sign of God's love for the church, spouses need to be willing to overcome who they are, their own hardness of heart, to change, to become more like Christ, to become more fully saints, growing closer to God and growing closer to each other. They have to have an attitude called readiness to change. This is from Dietrich von Hildebrand's book, Transformation in Christ, in which he's talking about what is it like to experience becoming holy? What are the attitudes of life that need to be taken on to become a saint? And his very first chapter is readiness to change. He says it's a more fundamental attitude for, than humility because it prepares for humility, which is the foundation of all the virtues. You can't become humble unless you're ready to change your life and step out of pride and into humility. It's detachment from what makes us comfortable. To be able to say, yeah, that was good, that was comfortable for now, but now I see something better. Now I see where I have to change. And we all need this in order to fully become the saints we're called to be. I need this as well, this readiness to change. Some of the men that I knew in seminary, to all appearances, some of the most miserable ones, were also the ones who seemed, to all appearances, to be most attached to who they were, to be unwilling to change. Most of the time what happened was they left the seminary. Or at some point, they became willing and ready to change. And they accepted the formation that the seminary was giving them. But before then, they were pretty miserable. Because the seminary exists to change a man to become a priest. Marriage has to be the same way. There has to be the readiness to change, to flex one's personality, to become more like Christ in that marriage. Fulton Sheen's example of that triangle, God at the top to two spouses are the corners. And as they move closer to God, they move closer to each other, and vice versa. But that doesn't happen unless you're ready to leave your corner, unless we're ready to move out of that with change. And this can be especially hard in marriages. Think of the seminarians. They're just one person trying to change just themselves. But in marriage, it's two people who are there to help each other grow and change and move towards God. And this is supposed to be a lot easier, right? You have somebody there to help you. But it can also be a lot more difficult because you're also supposed to help them grow in virtue, to overcome their vices and faults, and to move towards God. This is, of course, worse and sometimes impossible when the marriage is filled with mortal sin, right? When things like adultery are happening and contraception when abuse is happening. And those are terrible situations in which if one spouse is trying to grow closer to God and the other isn't, they are left with this giant cross to carry. Or even those who have suffered from broken marriages in their lives, children or spouses, and left with this giant cross to carry of 
the other person not having changed to make the relationship work, not having grown or converted with God's grace to become more like Christ and to reflect that union of Christ and his church. The mortal sin tears apart and degrades everything. Instead of advancing towards each other, with each mortal sin, they fall further apart as they fall further away from God. So lest we come to that point, falling away from God because of our own inability to change, our attachment to who we are or to what we do, let us examine our readiness to change for the sake of others, for the sake of a spouse, for the sake of children, but especially for the sake of Christ since we are supposed to reflect him in his virtues, in his humility, in his love, in his, in his uh, example of faith, in his hope. We are supposed to live all those things fully, becoming like Christ. Your spouse has been given to you to help you grow into the kingdom, to, and you've been given to them for that same purpose. Whether you're just married or have been for a while, have a full house of kids, or the kids have left, this purpose remains the same, to help the other person get to heaven, whether this be by example, whether this be by um, just telling, talking all the time about problems in marriage or the good things that are happening to help each other grow and become better human beings and more like Christ. All of these things are supposed to continue to go on because we're not supposed to remain the same. We're not supposed to just be who we are at this moment. I can't just remain Father Nathan on the 27th Sunday in ordinary time. I have to become better. I have to become more like Christ. I hope I am a little bit right now. But to become more like him, I'll never be too Christ-like. None of us will ever be too Christ-like. Leaving your father and mother to cling to your spouse and to become one flesh can then mean something a little different. Maybe father and mother is a metaphor at this point for those things that we see as defining who we are, for those things that make us who we are, those points of personality we're like, well, well, no, that's just who I am. Well, maybe it's not just who you are. Maybe how you respond to petty arguments, to passive-aggressive comments, maybe how you, maybe even making those passive-aggressive comments that's not who you're supposed to be. You're like, well, I've been doing this for for 20 years, for 30 years. This is who I am. You can change. God is asking you to change, to become more like Christ, to become one in Christ with a spouse if you're married. And as we do this, as we change, as we convert, as we bring those virtues to life within us, that humility, faith, hope, charity, generosity, as those things become more and more part of our life, hardness of heart, that stubborn attachment to who we are or just how life is right now, as that disappears and grows away, we'll find it becomes easier to accept the kingdom of God, easier to pick up our crosses, easier to accept everything that God wants us to be in order to go to heaven. We will become more like children, open to God transforming us, changing us, raising us into the mature sons and daughters of God that he wants us to be. And then we can accept the kingdom of God like a little child. And we can enter into that eternal, and what's right now maybe unfamiliar, but will be a comfortable, beyond all our wildest dreams, eternal happiness.